Today we're continuing our series of traveling through Psalms, and we're going to be in Psalms 37. You know, it's just a funny reminder. You know, we all get distracted uh, from driving from time to time. But more than that, we get distracted from just living life. Uh, Things come up, we lose focus. I heard the other day a definition of multitasking. It's you're doing something until you remember what you were really wanting to do in the first place. Um, When I was uh, growing up, we used to go camping on trips with my family. And uh, this one time, Dad was going to get off work, and uh, we were supposed to have everything ready. He was running late. Um, So he backed up to the camper. Uh, We loaded things in the truck, made sure, you know, uh, turned everything off in the house. We jumped in the truck. We're going down. We get two houses down from the house, and the trailer comes unhitched. Now, this is in the days before safety chains. So dad speeds up. We're looking in the back uh, glass of the truck, watching sparks and gravel and street flying everywhere. And it goes for about six houses until it coasts into somebody's driveway. Uh, Needless to say, we left a little bit later than that. Um, But... Every time we went down that end of the street, it was a physical reminder of that vacation because there was a stripe of asphalt that was missing for about six houses. And that lasted for decades until they redid the street. You know, we have that same thing in our lives, too, is we allow things into our lives. We become distracted, and we have stripes in our lives that remind us of those times that we become distracted. Distractions keep you from where God wants to lead. Psalms 37 verses 1 and 2 says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they will soon wither, and like green plants they will soon die away. Another translation put the first part of that verse like this, Don't be upset because of the evil people. Don't be jealous of those who... Who do wrong. You know, what we allow into our lives can distract us from God. Sometimes it's like going to a buffet. You pull up there with your tray and your huge plate, and you go, Oh, I like that. Oh, that's my favorite. Uh, I, I would like to try that. I've never tried it. Let's get some of that. Oh, that's some, I love that. And then we have a huge plate, and it's things that we've put into our, our plate ourselves. But it's also things like that in life. We put things that, oh, I like doing that. Oh, I've always wanted to try that. And we put those in our lives. And before long, we're distracted from following God and what he wants in our lives. And not all these things are bad. But they become a problem when we allow them to distract us from where God wants to lead us. There are six areas I just want to cover real quickly. Uh, that can distract us from following God and what He wants in our lives and where He wants to lead. The first one is money and possessions. Um, You know, it's easy to look at other people and say, why can't I drive a car like that? Or why can't I wear clothes like that? And so we become envious of other people and it distracts us from what God wants us to do and the people that God wants us to be. The second one is relationships. We say, God, how come I can't be in that group? I want to be friends with them. Why can't I be friends with them? Why why don't they invite me to do stuff? And so we focus on those relationships instead of investing in a relationship with God and allow Him to work in and through our lives. A big distraction is media, whether it's movies or TV, maybe it's videos or YouTube, Or maybe it's uh, video games. Uh, You know, when you're on YouTube and you say, oh, that looks pretty funny, let me watch it. And before long you go, oh, oh, I've been watching these for 40 minutes. Or maybe you say, I'm going to play a video game and I'll be done. I'm just going to give it 30 minutes. And then you look and you've been there a couple hours. And it's because we become distracted and involved in that instead of looking for what God wants us to do with our time. The fourth one is work. Sometimes we're looking for that perfect opportunity, that perfect job where we're happy, and it doesn't matter about everything else. It's just as long as this is what I want. 
and we see people who have jobs said, well, I can do that job better than they can. Why didn't they pick me? Maybe God wants you to be in a certain position to help other people around you, but we're too busy thinking about ourselves instead of looking to see how God wants to use us. The fifth thing is hobbies. Or maybe it's uh, your kids' sports. Man, it's tough because we're out there. We want good experiences for our kids. We need some time to relax. And that in of itself is not wrong. It's not bad. It's not evil. It just becomes a distraction from when we can, from the things that God wants us to do. You know, there are so many things in the world that fight for our time. And when we allow them to take too much, well, we lose focus and we get distracted. And at times we need to cut these distractions out entirely. And at other times we need to look at those things and keep them in check the right balance that they need in our lives so that they don't become a distraction. And I think number six is one of our biggest distractions of all that keeps us from where God wants to lead us is ourselves. James 1.4 says, Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. Man, how powerful is that? The things that we allow into our lives and the things that... We desire ourselves, they drag us away from following God and focusing on Him. It's because we become distracted in life. Romans 6.11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. I love how another translation puts this. It says, In the same way, you must continuously consider yourselves dead and as far as sin is and concerned and concerned about living for God through Messiah Jesus. So it's not just saying, oh, we're going to be dead to sin. It's a continually reminder that I'm not going to be distracted from following God and I'm going to focus on following God. I'm going to focus on living for God in our lives. I, I saw this quote and it says, the danger is not that we will become unbelievers, but that we will be disheartened. The danger is not that we will lose all faith, but that we will find our faith weakened. Let me read that again and let those words sink in. The danger is not that we will become unbelievers, but that we will be disheartened. The danger is not that we will lose all faith, but that we will find our faith weakened. You see, when we become distracted, it's not that we're going to deny Christ. It's not that we're not, we don't believe anymore. It's just that I'm discouraged in my walk with God. And when those tough spots come, our faith isn't strong enough to carry us through and we stumble in those times. And that's because we become distracted in the main relationship that we need in our lives. And let me just finish up with this. Don't let the noise of the world distract you from hearing the voice of the Lord. Find lasting joy by drawing closer to God. So don't live a distracted life. Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> I pick up on the journey in verses 3 and 4. If you could look down at that spot in Psalms 37, verses 3 and 4, and it says very simply, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture or something to that effect. Uh, different translations. And then we get verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. These two verses follow the typical pattern that we find throughout the Old Testament, specifically in the Psalms. We get in a command or an admonition followed with a promise. And these two verses are no exception. However, the second verse there, verse 4, is notorious for being abused over the years. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's just jump in right here. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Um, in preparation for uh, this sermon, I am in the middle of the walk through the Bible material. And the first day of the walk through the Bible material, uh, it deals with the fall of man. And all the, the curses that happen because of the fall. 
and, uh, and, and how the fall fundamentally broke us on such a significant level. It's really hard to wrap our arms around. Well, at the end of the first day's devotion, it has this statement, and so you're getting kind of a little bit of a sneak peek at what you'll be reading in a month, but it really caught my attention, and um, it, it says this real simply, God is good. Creation proves that. The fall distorts my perception of God's goodness and truth. And all of life is shaped by how willing we are to trust God's goodness and to relate to him on that basis. Simple statement, but has profound implications on how we process life. Because at the fall, there was an exchange that happened. And what happens is, is I stop trusting his goodness. I, I almost become suspect of everything God tells me, all his commands. Are they really going to put me in a better place? Are they really, is, does God really have my best interest at heart? Because most of what God tells me to trust in makes no sense to me. I mean, just think about some of the things he says, like, uh, wives, submit to your husbands. You want to start a fight? You read some of the things that he asked the Jews to do in the Old Testament to give almost all their possessions certain times of the year. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense some of the things he asked us to trust him in. Because at the fall, that flip happened. I don't trust you anymore, God. I don't think you have my best interest at heart. In fact, this concept of trust is so critical to the Christian life that the writer of the book of Hebrews says that without trust in the Lord... You can't please him. It's almost like a, a trust is God's love language. That's what he responds to. I wish trusting in the Lord was something you could bank. You know what I mean by that? Like you showed trust over here as a teenager. You showed it years ago when, you know, maybe you made a decision. It doesn't work that way. Trust is something that is new every single day and every week. And then David attaches this promise to trusting in God and doing good. He says, you will dwell in the land and have safe pasture. Do you guys know the first command with a promise, or at least a beneficial promise? Anybody, any good Bible scholars in here? The fifth command. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord is giving you. This is the identical same promise. Dwelling in the land meant everything to the Jew. All the covenantal promises that, uh, and God's goodness were all tied to living in the land. So I guess I'm going to try to make a parallel jump here, all right? A person who expresses trust over the long haul in what God tells them to do will experience the equivalent of a Jew being in the land. You'll experience the full goodness and mercy and compassion of God in all seasons of life just by simply trusting him. Then we move to verse 4. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of of your heart. Could there be two more opposite thoughts found in two verses or one verse? Delight yourself in the Lord. That comes natural to none of us. Let's just be honest, all right? And give me the desires of my heart. Everybody can relate to that. Now, this verse is actually a really interesting verse. Two years ago on the Stephen Colbert show, this is how popular this, this verse is. Oprah Winfrey cited this as her favorite verse. That should give you pause before we jump in. The first time I ever heard this verse, at least I remember, was several years ago. I was in a Bible study with several men. And this guy was talking about how he's growing in the Lord and seeing God work in his life. And he used this verse to justify buying a $60,000 bass boat. I got to believe that's not what David was attempting to communicate here. Delight yourself in the Lord. 
Delight is not a word that we usually use when we relate to God. However, I looked up almost every single translation, and guess what word they use here? Delight. So some of you might not be inclined to describe this as the way you relate to God because this is not the way I'm wired. But I would suggest to you that we are all experts at delighting in something. Right? I mean, think about it. Just, we delight in movies, music, food, sports athletes and their exploits, fit bodies, sunsets, rivers. We delight in all kinds of things, and those are just the good things. I haven't even got to the sin. Our hearts are an idle factory waiting to delight in things. So in one way or another, I believe from the beginning of Psalms all the way to the end, this is exactly what David is attempting to communicate, and he's just coming at it from so many different angles. This is the posture that he's trying to capture. So you might not be comfortable with the Lord delight, but I've got to believe that when Jesus told us a thousand years later, and he asked, what's the great, someone asked him, what's the greatest command? He says, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. I got to believe delights in there somewhere. So if you don't use the word delight, you use the word love, savor, all, joy. I think it's all coming at it from the same angle. Now the question is, how do you delight yourself in the Lord? I don't think it's something that happens overnight. I don't think you can just grit your way and will your way into delight. I think delight is the result of a lifetime of obeying God in every situation. I think it's a lifetime of meditating on his scripture, memorizing it, and just seeing the beauty of who he is. And then God slowly wires you for delight. We are wired to delight in things we admire. It's just that simple. I end this concept of delight with this thought, and then I'll go to the promise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are told that one of Satan's primary jobs is to blind us to the glory and the beauty of Christ. Satan knows that if he can blind you to the beauty of our Lord, the enjoyment and delight will never take hold in your life. And he typically does that through lesser delights. Then we get this amazing promise attached to delighting in Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. If I just read that in this, in this, just read that, it'd be like nails on a chalkboard. You're like, are you serious? Because my heart is desperately wicked. It's full of impure motives, unwise motives. It's dark. So there's got to be something going on here. And I think you all connect it. I think all of you see the connection here. There's a very fascinating dynamic that's going on here. And, and there's a cause and effect. There clearly is a relationship between delighting in the Lord and him giving you the desires of your heart. They are inseparably connected. Here's the logic. And I think you all get it. When we begin to delight ourselves in the Lord then our desires come in line with what is on our Father's heart. It's the ultimate bait and switch. It's almost like God says, great, now I can give you the desires of your heart because they're exactly what I desire. And Jesus again said these words a thousand years later after this was written in John 15, 7. If you, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Same concept. The conditions of God answering your prayer, and this is where I end if you want to come up, Deb, Deborah. The conditions of God answering your prayers is that his words abide in you. And we find out two verses later that abiding means that you are rapidly obeying 
him. So this is how I end. When his mission and his words become your passion and your satisfaction, then God can more regularly answer your prayers because they are not contradictory to his values and his mission. So here's, I'll just, in my own words, delight yourself in the Lord and ask whatever is on your heart because chances are that's exactly what God is shooting for. All right, we had church. We can go home. No. um, Psalm 37 is an amazing psalm. I love Psalm 37, and I learned a lot from from just hearing from uh, Ross and Roger and Jimmy about this psalm because we see in the verse 25, it's an incredible psalm to go through, and I encourage you to read it today uh, when you get home. In verse 25, we see that David is writing this psalm in his old age, reflecting back on all the years that he was living. And you think about David's life and the kingdom that he had and how he had you know, Saul chasing after him, constantly trying to kill him. And then he had his son who tried to take over his kingdom. And so he's writing this psalm as, as a wisdom. And we talk about wisdom for the road, wisdom for our life, wisdom for our journey. And you know, it reminds me of in the verse 5 and 6 is, is really my kind of love-hate of, of uh, navigation systems. Um, I have a big love-hate with them. When they first came out, it was like, man, these are cool. But then Apple, as you know, I'm a big Apple guy. I love Apple. I'm going to stick with Apple. And Apple Maps was terrible when it first came out. I feel like Michael Scott, when he's about to drive into the lake, you know, the nav systems tell him, drive. okay, I'm going to go. I remember times where it was like, there's a Taco Bell here. And I was like, there's no Taco Bell. It's like an empty field. I remember one time we were going over to the Nicholson's house, and it's like, park here and then walk 25 yards over the grass to their house. And you're like, what? You really have that in your system? And we get, we get this love-hate. We get this system of understanding of, of what navigation. But there was a time when I was going down to San Antonio. And if you've gone down 35, you know how terrible it is around the temple area. It's like construction that has been since I, you know, I'm 39 years old. And I think it's been under construction since 39 years ago. And I think it's just to give people jobs. But I remember a time where, you know, Apple Maps was sitting there and it says, you need to get off on the service road. And I'm like, well, how dumb is that? I'm on the freeway. It's fine. I don't see anything. Get off on the service road. And I was like, you know what? I know better than that. All right. I was like the guy on the, I I love that because it's like, I'm I'm that guy. I'm better than that. I'm going to get in the line. And so it had the time, five o'clock was when I was going to arrive in San Antonio. And I was like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. All of a sudden, about a mile ahead, I hit traffic. And it is standstill parking lot. And I look over to the service road and I look at all the people that trusted their nav systems and they're just flying by five o'clock when they're going to get there. And I'm sitting here and all of a sudden it goes to 530, six o'clock. I sat there until eight o'clock. I got at San Antonio. I hated myself for that because I trusted myself instead of trusting Apple Maps. So let me tell you something, wisdom for the road, trust your Apple Maps because when it says get off, get off on the service road because there's, tr- there's a wreck or something. But the thing is, is, is that's a lot like our lives and what David is talking about in Psalms 37, verses 5 and 6, because we get that way in our life. We tend to think, I know better than what God is saying, and, and we read Scripture, and, and we come up here, and we, we have Sunday mornings, and we hear God's Word being taught, and we're like, you know what, that's great stuff, but you don't know my life. It's a little more complicated than just a verse that gets said. It's a little more complicated than my life. And, and David, in his old age, is telling us, he says in Psalm 37, 5 and 6, he says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn and your justice like the noonday. And I love that visual of making your righteous shine. And you're just it's like noonday. It's like when the fog is there and all of a sudden in the noontime when that heat is in the noonday and it, it burns all the fog and you see clearly. It's such a beautiful picture of what it means to commit to the Lord. And we see this throughout Scripture of what it means because in, in Proverbs 16, 25, he says, you know, uh, his, his son writes this as wisdom. He says, some people think they are doing right, but in the end it leads to death. And I think that Solomon is writing that as, as kind of a, a reflection on what his dad had written about committing to the Lord in this psalm. That we don't understand really sometimes what God's path is leading to. That he's calling us to commit to the Lord, trust in the Lord. And the thing is, is, is we see this in the encouragement given here is to renounce all self-confidence and to look to God alone. Is that he will graciously undertake our case, bear our burdens and accomplish for us that which we can never bring to pass. David had a beautiful illustration of the truth he urged in his coming into full and peaceable possession of who God was and what God was doing. 
I love this verse because it really brings us peace and understanding. And, and here's how it does. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine. And what that making is, is, is we look at that making and it's like he's going to make it happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen that you're going to be righteous. It's going to happen that you're going to have this life that's going to shine. But what we don't understand is, is without understanding what David is doing in Psalm 37 of this wisdom, we don't have the full picture. Because in Psalm 37, 39, and 40, if you would turn there, because this is the ending of the psalm, and I love it because he wraps it up. It's a lot like the book of Ecclesiastes when it comes to the wisdom. It says this, The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord, the refuge in a time of distress. The Lord helps and delivers them. He will deliver them from the wicked and will save them because they take refuge in him. I love David and the Psalms because we see so much of him reflecting forward, the faith of what was to come. See, when David says, commit to the Lord, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like a noonday sun, it's like something ahead is coming. It's like he sees the path that's coming, and what we see is he's alluding to what is to come. What is it that's righteousness? What is it that is going to, to give us justice? What is going to free us? And we see that in Christ. Because Christ says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lonely and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Man, I, I love that verse. And if you're like me today, you want that verse to be so true. You want that verse to be what is, is truth in your life. You want to walk out of here today going, you know what, God? I want to come to you because I want my burdens. I want to lay them down to you. It's like that navigation system. I want it to be so true, and I, I just want to not be in traffic. I just want, to, I just want it to take me and, and lead me to the path that's not going to be full of traffic and through burdens and stress. But that's made by man, but what God is speaking here is truth. We all came today with burdens. We all came today with things, and as David's reflecting on his life, think about all the burdens that he had in his life. He had a king that tried to kill him. A king that he saved the kingdom with Goliath. He had a son that tried to take over his kingdom. A kingdom that his son didn't deserve. And yes, he committed sins, but he found trust and he found a love and understood righteousness. A man that says, making your righteousness shine like the dawn. This is a man that his sin probably defined him. He couldn't run from that. You, it didn't change. Gossip was there in the Bible. And so people were probably talking about him. He says, it's making your righteousness shine like the dawn. Your justice like a noonday sun. There's, a re there, there's something coming that's going to make that happen. And he trusts in that and he commits to that. And here's what I want to tell you today in that commitment. When I was reading this passage, I was thinking about a time when I was a child. I was eight years old and, and my family loved to go to Colorado, Durango, Colorado. And we would go to Durango, Colorado. And one of the things we loved to do was take Engineer Pass. It's a, it's, it, it goes up in the mountains and, and we loved to go jeeping. And so me and my sister would sit in the back of the jeep while my parents, we'd drive up there, we'd stop, we'd have lunch. We'd enjoy this beautiful scenery. And I remember when I was eight years old in particular this time because my dad had done this trip with his family. So he knew Engineer Pass just, I mean, he didn't need a map. He needed all this. And we got stuck up there, um, kind of up at the very top. We had spent way too much time. The sun was going down in the mountains. The sun goes down faster because it, it ducks behind the mountains. And I remember a guy saying, hey, you need to really get down from the mountain because it's about to get dark. And so we're going down, and I remember it was just pitch black. And as an eight-year-old child, I was in the back just so scared. And I remember looking at my dad, and he wasn't scared. He was navigating the, the pass, and he was going and driving. And I was so scared because we were out in these middle of nowhere, these woods. And I'm like, what is going to happen? And as a child, it seemed like a big deal to my dad. It wasn't a big deal because he had been down those passes. And I remember as soon as we turned on a road and I saw civilization, my fear went away. And I remember seeing my dad just very stoic because he knew the pass. He had driven it. He had seen his parents drive it. He knew exactly what to do. And here's where I want to encourage you with what David is saying today. Christ has walked in your shoes. See, God came down 
to this earth so that he could walk and know our path. He experienced everything that we experience. It's nothing new to him. We're not talking to a God. We're not committing to a God that has never walked in our shoes. He's never gone before us. My dad didn't need navigation. He knew it. And God knows our life. And God wants us to commit to him because he knows everything about us. Today you walked in with burdens. Today you walked in with a heavy heart. Going, no one understands, but I'm telling you, Jesus Christ does. He came down to this earth. And this is the thing I wanted you to take on the wisdom of the road. Trust in a God that knows our path. Trust in him because he's walked our path. He has been with us. When I first started driving, my dad um, gave me his S15 GMC pickup. It was a little pickup. It wasn't a full-size, uh, you know, one of the big ones. Uh, it was also a stick shift. Anybody grow up driving a stick shift or had to learn on a stick shift? Uh, I don't recommend that. And this pickup had uh, no air condition. In the summers, and you know Texas summers, I grew up in Abilene, uh, I never, ever rolled up my windows, even when it rained. I, I just didn't roll it because I was so hot. Uh, and, and even when I wasn't in my pickup, I never rolled them up. I remember getting, going out of church. I, I, I was an intern at, at Pioneer Drive, my home church. And I remember leaving the office and coming out of my pickup, and there was a, just a dead bird in the passenger seat. I don't know if he just went in there and died because it was so hot, or my window was open and somebody just chunked him in there. But um, I just remember seeing that. A cool feature of the pickup, though, was you didn't really need the keys. The ignition was kind of loose, so you could just kind of jiggle it and turn it, and it would go. And so um, I would just say, you know, let people borrow my pickup, and they said, well, can I have the keys? And I was like, ah, you don't need them. Um, it was painted by, it was painted by uh, high school students. Back in, I don't know if you remember, there used to be, like, I don't know if there still is, shop class and, and auto mechanics, and so you could take it. My dad taught at Cooper, and so he'd get our vehicles fixed by high school students. I don't know how safe that was, but the, the pickup was painted by uh, high school students at Cooper. It was red and white. and um, Anyway, it wasn't a lot to be proud of, but it was mine, and, and I loved it. One of the games I love to play in this pickup, uh, remember, I, I'm 16. I, I like to see how far I could go with my gas gauge on empty. Um, I, I, had a, I, I had a sort of an idea of, of how far I could go just because of the mileage, um, but, but I'm, I was always pushing it. And I would do this at any time of day, and no matter where I was. Uh, this wasn't, we, we didn't have cell phones back then or GPS where your parents could track you. So if I got stuck somewhere, I was stuck. And, and I did run out of gas a couple of times. I remember one time um, I, I was about to exit off a of Winter's Freeway and I was headed to, towards the church and my truck just, it just was done. And so I just popped that thing in neutral, and I just coasted down the exit. Fortunately, I didn't ever have to break right into a gas station. It was one of my proudest moments as a man. Um, and it was, it was pretty sweet. But I don't, I don't know why. I, I wasn't a smart kid. I'm still not a smart guy. But, um, but that just, I don't know why I just tried to live life, you know, on the truck, on empty. But, you, you know, you ever thought about being empty? You, you, ever, you ever felt empty? I looked up the definition online of what empty means, and it says containing nothing or having none of the usual or appropriate contents. You're empty. You don't have what you're supposed to have, and so you, you, you're, you're not able to move forward. And, and in Psalm 37, 7 through 9, um, you, you see that anger and jealousy will leave you empty and lead to unwise decisions. I want to read those verses. It says, Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated for him. Uh, for him. I'm sorry. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the person who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. For evil evildoers will be destroyed, but those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Um, Roger talked about uh, I'm sorry, in these three verses, he, David says, be silent before the Lord. Do not be agitated by one who prospers. Refrain from anger. Give up your rage. Why? Because those are the things that can only bring harm. And the opposite of those things, which we've learned is putting your hope, putting your trust in God, means that God will take care of us in this world and in the world to come. And so Roger talked about the distractions. Uh, Ross talked about trusting uh, in, in Christ and finding, delighting and in, in enjoying him. Chris just talked about trusting God because you, he knows your path. And, and so we close with that last little piece of wisdom. And it's kind of a combination of both, of, of distractions and trust. And two of Satan's biggest 
weapons against us are unrighteous anger and jealousy brought on by comparison. Those are two big things that, that he'll get us with. I, and I want to make sure that you understand what unrighteous anger is. It's not just anger. Anger is not bad. What you choose to do with your anger, that's, that's what can lead uh, to bad things. I, when I was doing counseling, I always tell kids that I would counsel, I would say this, just because you're mad doesn't mean you can act bad. And um, so don't hear me saying that anger is wrong, but when it's wrong, when it's sin, when it's unwise, it's when we let our anger lead us away from a trusting God and his path for our lives, and we turn bitter towards him because our lives are not working out like we think they should or like so-and-so's life is working out. Why can't we have the job or the promotion? Why can't we have more money? Why, why am I always sick? Why, why, are the, why are their kids doing better than our kids are? Why can't I find the right guy or the right girl? Why, is, why can't my husband be like him or my wife be like her? Why is their life so easy? And this anger towards God turns into jealousy towards others, and what that does is it empties the joy in our life. Proverbs 14, 30 says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Peace, joy, and then jealousy, peace and joy and jealousy, those are the exact opposites of each other. One brings life, and the other actually sucks the life right out of us. And, 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 and we know this. We all know, we all know what jealousy does. It makes us unhappy, and it makes us unsatisfied with everything in our lives. We stop seeing God's blessings and his faithfulness, and what we do is we become laser-focused on everything that we are not, everything that we don't have, and then laser-focused on everything that we think we should be and think we should have. We get distracted. We stop enjoying God. We stop trusting his leadership, and then we get mad. And that leads to foolish decisions. And one of the most foolish decisions we can make is trying to do life without God. Proverbs 29, 11 says this, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person holds it in check. Now, that, that, applicate, that verse can be applied to a lot of things. And, and you know what I think that verse is telling us in this context is, is don't make your decisions based on emotion. When, when, when emotions run high, logic runs low. The more intense the, the emotion, the more clouded your judgment will be. Ask, ask any counselor, ask any psychologist. Emotion is almost always reaction. It's not thinking. If you go back to verse 7, it says, Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. And you know what that word silent means there? Some of your Bibles may say, say rest or, or be still. But I think silent is probably a better term because it, it means that you're not going to try and defend yourself or state your case before God of why your life should be different or why you should be do, your, your life should look a certain way or, or why you should have more things. It's basically what that verse is. Basically, God's saying to us, just chill. Relax. I've got this. I've got you. Trust me. And it's easy to look around in this world and see people who seem to be doing life however they want to do it, uh, making up their own rules, following their own, their own agendas, and, and their life seems to be going A-OK. -okay. A lot of their life seems to be great. And we see other people, and maybe we put ourselves in this boat, we see other people who appear to be faithful to the Lord, and life is just struggling. They're just struggling. And we're quick to ask, why? Why, God? And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know why that happens. But here's what I do know. We were made for more than just earthly pleasures and earthly possessions and earthly success. We were made for eternity. And I know that God has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. And he has called us to follow him. Not what the world says makes you good. Not what the world says makes you powerful. Not what the world says gives you status. Not what the world says makes you important. God said, follow me. So if you want your life to be filled with peace and joy... You want, you want wisdom for, for your journey? Well, it all starts by surrendering your agenda, your priorities, your relationships, your resources, your self-esteem, your decisions, and I'll just go ahead and say it. It starts by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. When you do that, it won't make life perfect or easy, but your life will be in perspective, and you will learn that the distractions are just that. They're just distractions to keep you from enjoying God. 
from trusting his path for you and keep you from running on empty so that you will never be satisfied and never have what you need to live the way that God intended. A life without God ultimately, listen to this, a life without God ultimately leads to an empty life. And oh, by the way, that's Satan's whole agenda. He's not for you. He wants your life to just rot. God wants to give you life, and he wants to give you abundant life.